Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to, to the third webinar of the Policy Dialogue series uh, uh, organized by the Ethnic Survey Data Project. I'm sorry for these technical issues, issues, but this is how it is these days. Uh, I'm afraid that some registered participants may not be able to join, but uh, we're still recording the meeting, so hopefully they can catch up later. Uh, so my name is Marcelo Carami again, and I will moderate this, this webinar. I'm one of the coordinators uh, of the dissemination working group of ethnic survey data. Um, and I am coordinating this webinar series with Anna Ambrosetti from uh, Sapienza University, Rome, who is also here today. Uh, our topic today uh, is uh, monitoring immigrant integration with the longitudinal surveys. Uh, and we have three speakers. Uh, Thomas Liebig from the OECD uh, will give a presentation uh, um, on the use of longitud longitudinal data in the analysis of migration and migrant integration. Uh, we will then have a presentation by Alita Nandi from Understanding Society at University of Essex, and she will present uh, ethnicity and immigration research in the UK using Understanding Society, which is a project that she's involved in. And then we will have a, a commentary by Angela Paparusso uh, from the Institute for Research on Population and Social Policies at Italy's National Research Council. Uh, Alita and Tomas will be speaking for about 25 minutes each, uh, whereas Angela's commentary will be a bit shorter. And this should leave uh, a little less than uh, 30 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, we have chosen the setup of a standard meeting uh, this time rather than a webinar for this event. So, so you just raise your hand. Uh, virtually if you want to make comments or questions so normally we will take questions after the three presentations but if you feel like you have an important question do feel free to ask uh, maybe type it on the chat and in that case we will ask speakers to respond during or after their, their presentations but okay uh, without further ado uh, i would like to give the floor to the speakers and thank them again uh, we start with thomas Liebig. Uh, thomas please so I'm happy to present you some of the um, uh, some of our work that we have been doing using longitudinal uh, data on immigrants in the analysis of both integration and uh, uh, migration uh, processes. So as a starter, um, when you look uh, uh, clearly, integration is by definition a process that, that occurs over time. So right, I mean any analysis clearly that looks at integration process, but also migration processes need some kind of longitudinal perspective. Um, also, when you look at any program effectiveness analysis, you, some, you need a before and after comparison. That's a very basic thing, um, but a very basic thing that as you, as those who look at uh, particular integration program effectiveness, uh, uh, you see relatively rarely well done. Uh, so some of the, uh, there's basically, uh, when you look at the source of longitudinal data in the traditional sense, and I'll come later on to the alternatives of, of proper longitudinal data, uh, we have a register data. So that's, these have been traditionally very widespread in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, sorry, that should be uh, Sweden rather than Finland here at the end, obviously. Um, uh, so Denmark, Finland, uh, a little bit less than, no than the other three. Uh, uh, um, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden have the strongest register data, Finland a little bit less, uh, but it's also getting there. And then we have emerging register data, which are being used and linked uh, uh, across different uh, data uh, uh, sources um, uh, in countries like uh, Belgium, Canada, Switzerland, Italy, New Zealand, Netherlands, and soon actually uh, Germany is also having a major project where that where it's going to be moving in that uh, in that direction. And, and I think we're going to get a lot of new research coming out of there uh, uh, in a couple of years time too. Then there's proper longitudinal surveys of immigrants. Uh, here the focus has generally been on new arrivals. When you look at specific market specific longitudinal surveys, clearly they cover new arrivals. Um, um, there's right now one, one ongoing in Germany, a new project also in France, a, a second, second wave of the longitudinal survey of, uh, of, uh, of new arrivals. Previously, this has been, there have been surveys, and I'm probably missing some here, um, but um, uh, Australia, Canada, and it actually should not be Netherlands, but New Zealand, 
uh, uh, United Kingdom and US all have had longitudinal surveys of, of immigrants. Some of these are pretty dated, actually, I must say, uh, partly because these countries have moved to uh, using more registered data and then they saw less need of those proper longitudinal surveys. And there's other large scale longitudinal sources of the general population, uh, you know, for example, in the UK. Uh, some have done a specific migrant sample boosting. For example, in Germany, the, the German SOAP has a, um, has a specific migrant sample boosting. So to make sure that these are adequately covered and that you can do some analysis uh, also on migrants and not only on the native one. So when you look, when you compare register data versus longitudinal uh, uh, migrant uh, data, and clearly register data has the advantage that it's of the highest quality and it's, it's based on administrative uh, sources, so clearly it's highest quality. There's no data sample size issues. There's often an issue with data protection and access then also linked to that and different countries have different rules here. Uh, and uh, another thing that needs to be taken into account is that these register data have generally not been set up specifically for the study of migration and integration processes. So longitudinal migrant service by definition have been set up for that purpose. So they're allow, allowed to look at specific focus groups at specific points of interest at specific issues that uh, particular at issues that administrative sources cannot adequately capture. Um, uh, and here, I think the greatest potential clearly is in social integration, but interestingly so, social integration is really studied in those long, I mean, you have the questions often there, but it's not in the focus of analysis of people who use it. So surveys that look at standard stuff like employment rates over time or educational attainment, language progress that goes a little bit in the middle, I would say, um, attrition clearly is a big issue when you look at longitudinal migrant surveys, particularly when you go for longer time uh, horizons, and we know that some groups are very mobile uh, uh, and, and following those up over time and making sure that, that, uh, that the surveys also remain representative over time is, is a challenge. So that can be quite costly, and drawing and maintaining a representative sample can be very challenging. So, uh, and as I said, most studies only cover recent arrivals because also after three to five years, clearly it gets almost impossible to have a sufficient sample size in these uh, longitudinal migrant surveys to continue, uh, to continue the exercise. I'm not aware of any country that has a migrant specific longitudinal uh, uh, survey uh, focusing notably on new arrivals and that has uh, going, been going on for, for, more than, for more than five years with, with large samples. Um, so here clearly there's a need to be aware upfront of what you want to get out of it, right? I mean, uh, uh, countries, as I said, have moved away from these surveys because quite often, like when we talk to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they say, well, we didn't really get so much out of these longitudinal uh, data sets uh, than we expected, so we're no longer pursuing that route. Um, some of the, uh, some of the e examples that we have done from our work on migration process. So here, for example, we have uh, used longitudinal data in, in the Netherlands to look at our probability of staying for high school labor migrants, whether or not the, the spouse has been working. So and as you can see, the probability to, re to remain in the country, so retention of that group, which you want to stay, which you want to stay in your country, uh, is much higher, almost 20 percentage points higher after five years um, uh, when the spouse is working compared to those high school labor migrants whose spouse has not been working. Uh, another uh, uh, um, uh, uh, data set that we've used, for example, here for Canada, uh, where we looked at administrative data and looking basically what happened to the, those who have been admitted as permanent labor migrants in Canada's uh, uh, economic migration uh, uh, program. What have they done before? Have they been already in the country before? That's the onshore transitions, that's these diamonds that you see. You see that's clearly increased over time. And what permit had those who were transiting onshore before? Did they have only a study permit? Did they have only a work permit, for example, like temporary workers and then transiting to permanent residency? Or did they have both? Uh, and you actually you see that the bulk actually of the growth has been coming from that latter category people who had both a study permit and a work permit. So that kind of had that combination. Um, looking at integration data, some examples here from the French uh, ELIPA. Um, 
where we are, uh, where my colleague Yves Brehm, and I would like to thank him for having stepped in and supporting me with this uh, presentation here. Uh, uh, I only, uh, uh, our, my colleague uh, Cecil Thoreau was supposed to help me, uh, uh, um, got, got sick yesterday uh, and actually we were supposed to do it together. And so Eva uh, kindly, uh, kindly helped out with some of this, his knowledge because he's been one of the driving people in the French Elipa. And here you can see, for example, um, uh, um, the, the type of language, uh, a language progress of, uh, of new arrivals in a country like France. And you see actually the shares of those who have poor language skills in France is not very high. Um, um, uh, that's basically, that's after admission. People may have been in the country before or irregular on an irregular status, but that's after, after legal admission. And you see, uh, you see some progress in language, but not as much as one would have thought, but also because of relatively low shares of people who don't have good French mastery uh, um, uh, as a starter. Um, but also you see that those who had language training, that relatively small subgroup of the total sample, uh, here you see uh, that the share of those who had poor uh, language uh, skills nevertheless uh, uh, dropped quite a bit. Um, one of the big advantages of register data, in addition to all you know, the quality and sample size issues, is that you can follow different migrant cohorts over time and compare how these are faring and then relate that to policy or other changes. Here I give you an example from, from Sweden. Um, and you can see actually that subsequent cohorts uh, uh, have been better in the early years. Uh, so you see that the latest cohort, so it's the 2017 uh, uh, arrivals, uh, obviously um, we, we still wait for new data coming in, but you see that those green bars are consistently above the red bars, which are consistently about the blue bars. Um, and, uh, and so you see that basically there's been a progress in the integration of that specific group of refugees in Sweden over time uh, when you look at, 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 at different cohorts. So that's actually very good, uh, 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 a very good uh, um, outcome, obviously. One would have to dig deeper clearly to see whether that's due to a better integration policy, better economic conditions, or uh, other changes in the composition of that, uh, of that refugee group. Um, so, You've seen those lists of countries that have some kind of longitudinal data, and, and clearly that list is far, even though I've missed a few, certainly with most countries don't really have proper longitudinal sources yet. So what are some of the alternatives to longitudinal data? Well, one issue, one thing that one can do is obviously to look at pseudo core. When you, uh, if you take a high quality uh, survey and if you have a large sample and if you have a sufficiently large immigrant population in particular, which is not the case in all countries, um, then for example, you can use things like the labor force survey and can build some pseudo cohorts. Here we have done that. Um, uh, and, and again, thanks to Eve uh, for, for uh, having produced this uh, yesterday evening at, uh, after eight o'clock, um, um, the change uh, between 2014 and 2019 in the employment rates of, uh, of adult migrants who arrived um, uh, uh, five years uh, uh, earlier. So we're basically looking at, uh, at, at that change over time in, in five years um, um, using the same cohort and doing, uh, sorry, taking uh, two uh, different time, uh, points of time uh, in the cross-sectional data and looking at different durations of residence. So basically we, we have a pseudo cohort here and you see basically uh, uh, quite some progress uh, in countries what you also uh, expect even though uh, um, the, the, the progress is not always uh, very large. And interestingly, so it's not so large in, in those countries which have more of a labor migration. That's also what you would expect like Luxembourg, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, these countries have a lot of labor migrants. So clearly they don't progress so quickly than countries like the Netherlands or France, uh, uh, where labor or, or Sweden, for example, here, where uh, the share of labor migrants uh, uh, has been much lower among the total migrant intake. So the picture gives you actually what you would expect here. Um, and, uh, and alternatively, obviously the easiest thing, the standard thing to do is to look at duration of residence, right? That's uh, all of us have done that at, at some, some time. Um, uh, here, for example, we used the migration module of the 2000, 
uh, uh, 14 EU LFS and looked by different category across European OECD countries, duration of stay in 2014, um, uh, clearly these, these are very different groups, right? The refugees who have arrived more than 20 years ago, these are predominantly from the former Yugoslavia and the recently arrived refugees uh, are, are more from countries like uh, prior to, 2000, uh, to 2014. These were countries like Afghanistan, Somalia and, and, and the like, uh, not so much Syria that's at that time, obviously. But nevertheless, in spite of a different composition, you kind of see the trend that refugees start with very low employment rates and, and do better over time. Those, the labor migrants, obviously most labor migrants in Europe come with a job and then they, the rate can only go down. And the family migrants are somewhere uh, in between with very low employment rates initially and then they are also a, a progress. Um, but things get more complex when you look at all migrants and when you look at country specific things uh, by duration of residence. So here we have plotted that uh, the, for the single year of 2019 by country and duration of residence. You see, for a lot of countries, particularly those at the right hand side of, this, of, uh, of the graph, you see the pattern as you would expect, right? The recent arrivals have much lower outcomes. Uh, um, uh, um, much larger gaps in that sense in, in terms of uh, uh, with respect to the native born uh, population in terms of employment rates um, uh, than, than those who have been a little bit longer in the country and those who have settled who have more than 10 years, they have uh, uh, much better outcomes. Um, it kind of gets a lot more messy when you get to the right hand side because here you see countries like, um, uh, like, like Poland where you have the exact opposite those settled migrants have very poor outcomes and the ones who are recent arrivals have very good outcomes. So clearly that runs counter to the general uh, uh, intuition, but it's also due to the fact that Poland, most of those uh, settled migrants are, are basically close to retirement age, are very uh, are basically uh, minorities that, that have, were affected by the border changes after, after the Second World War or, 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 or in other processes. Um, uh, and while those are recent arrivals, they're mainly labor migrants uh, from, from Ukraine and other countries. So, so you see a lot more in the, and what do the countries on the right-hand side have in common compared to those on the left-hand side? Well, most countries on the left-hand side are relatively large and long-standing migration countries. Those on the right-hand side are relatively recent migration countries and with the exception of Luxembourg, um, and have relatively small migrant populations as well in most, in most cases. That's why you see that kind of different picture. Um, when we, uh, there's also migrant specific surveys that, that look, that at least allow you to kind of address for different composition. Here, for example, some countries have done, uh, um, uh, Germany and Austria did a survey of all the refugees or the, the, the representative sample of refugees from certain countries. Um, um, but taking uh, a sample at a, at a given point of time and not following over time. Uh, and that exercise was, was done in around uh, 2016, I believe. And here, um, and here you can see, so you, we can again plot by duration of residence for that specific group. And you see the patterns generally as expected. We did that, compared that with, with countries, uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark here. And you see the pattern is always as expected, but you get you know, very quickly into sample size issues, uh, uh, particular for, for example, uh, new arrivals and for those who've been very long, long in the country. So, so it's, it's far from ideal, uh, these kind of surveys for longitudinal uh, monitoring, these cross-sectional surveys, clearly. Interestingly, however, we, uh, we, for the Scandinavian countries where we had proper longitudinal data, we saw very similar results. Um, and basically, interestingly, when you do a proper longitudinal analysis, and actually in, you can even, uh, and that uh, researchers in, in Norway, for example, have done that, and, and also uh, controlling for, um, for different cohort effects, and they found that there was a pretty robust co uh, cutoff point in Sweden, for example, after nine, nine to ten years, uh, when the progress halted for men, um, uh, the, 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 the increase in the employment, pro, uh, employment rate in Norway actually halted after seven to eight years. And it was pretty robust across cohorts uh, and controlling for differences in socioeconomic uh, other uh, characteristics. Whereas for women, actually, the, the integration was going on for at least 12 years. 
Um, and then there's obviously the last possibility to kind of do recall questions. What happened a year ago? What happened earlier ago? And here I give you perhaps a, a very long, long time horizon of, um, of, uh, of recall questions. So young people aged around 25 were asked here, um, what was your mother doing while you were 15 year old? So that's a very long time horizon for recall question, but it allows you even to look at these intergenerational processes um, uh, in a, in a cross-sectional survey. Um, that is both intertime and intergenerational. And here are the interesting finding, as you can see, whether or not the mother was reported to have worked when the respondents were 15 years old, um, was for women from non-EU origins associated with a much higher employment rate. So when the mother was working, they had an employment rate of almost 73 percent. Um, and when the mother was not working, it was uh, only uh, 57 percent for, for the women uh, from non-EU origins. And that also holds actually one week. And it's pretty robust, even when you control for a lot of other uh, factors. So to conclude, uh, any solid analysis of migration and integration processes requires longitudinal data. And these are becoming more and more widespread. I think that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that solid evaluations of integration programs using longitudinal data are still very rare, and I think there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, the trend is clearly going towards integrated administrative data rather than towards longitudinal migrant surveys, notwithstanding some prominent uh, exceptions, for example, France and, and in Germany. But it's, I, I think these will be, will be fading out as notably, for example, Germany. Uh, uh, will have its, its integrated register system uh, uh, being initiated very soon. And also the interest in your arrivals is, is less obviously now than it was uh, around the refugee crisis. Um, and the longitudinal migrant service, and with that I would like to conclude, they have their main benefit in cases where you have administrative data, which you can use, um, is for the survey of social integration. Because that you cannot capture with administrative data which is an under-researched area of high policy interest. But it's very hard to find a proper um, a longitudinal analysis um, uh, using those surveys to, to look at the social integration. So one way can really ask, I mean, what's then the use of all those, of all those surveys um, uh, if, if they do the basic stuff only? So I think that really merits a lot more reflections, including also in the design of the questionnaire. So with that, with that uh, I would like to conclude. I look forward to the discussion. Um, uh, just uh, to tell you also that our data sets, uh, and, and for example, the, or notably the setting in data set um, uh, is, uh, which, which I'm not, if you're not aware, I really encourage you to look at it. It's the largest data set database on migrant integration outcomes uh, worldwide. And we're continuously expanding it uh, jointly with our colleagues in the EU. And uh, you can all find that on our website or feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this very interesting presentation. Um, like I said, uh, we, we go on with the with presentations now and then uh, we can collect questions later. So I would ask, I would invite Alita uh, to, to present uh, her project. So um, I'm uh, an associate director for Outreach for Understanding Society. I'm also a senior research fellow at ICER and I'll talk to you about ethnicity and migration research that you can do using understanding society data. And so while Thomas was um, gave a very nice presentation and talked about um, the uh, advantages and disadvantages of existing surveys, so I was uh, looking at the uh, sort of checking all the list. And I think we do address uh, most of the issues that he raised and you can see that as I go through the talk. So yes, so um, at, uh, the way we operationalized um, or made it easier to use our study for ethnicity and migration research was we did three things. We put ethnicity at the core of the study, uh, which uh, um, basically what we did is we allowed a lot of very uh, measures of ethnicity, migrant status, ethnic identity, because as uh, those of you who do research in this area know that um, ethnicity is a multidimensional complex concept. Different uh, people from dif um, different uh, have different ways of measuring ethnicity. So we didn't want to a priori say how ethnicity should be measured and um, allowed for various measures. 
Second, we allowed ethnic minority boost samples. Uh, as you know, in order to have large enough sample sizes of different ethnic groups to allow research separately for each group and allow comparisons across groups. But the third thing that we did was additionally allow five minutes of extra question time uh, for questions that are of particular interest for ethnicity and immigration research. And now I will expand more on these as I go through the talk. So Understanding Society is a, a, the UK Household Longitudinal Study. And as the name suggests, it's a longitudinal study. It started in 2009 with a nationally representative sample of around 26,000 UK households. And this is referred to as the general population sample. We also added an ethnic minority boost sample of around 4,000 households. And then six years later, we added an immigrant and ethnic minority boost sample of around 2,500 households. Now I'll go uh, into a little bit of detail of how these boost samples were designed so, so that it becomes clearer why this is useful for your research. So the target was that we should at least have 1,000 adult interviews from each of the five key ethnic minority groups in the UK. These are uh, Black African, Bangladeshi, Black Caribbean, Indian, and Pakistani groups, but also include all other ethnic groups that, um, ethnic minority groups that we are able to screen. Now, the as you can imagine that, uh, by definition, ethnic minority groups are a very small proportion of the population. Currently, they make up about 14% of the UK population. And so if we had actually just randomly chosen addresses and screened these addresses for these ethnic minority groups, the cost would be pro prohibitively high. And so what we did was we selected um, high ethnic minority concentration areas. And in these areas, we selected around 44,000 addresses. And then at the doorstep, the interview, uh, interviewer did the screening um screen uh, administered the screening question so the interviewer asked does anyone living at this address come from or have parents or grandparents from any one of the following ethnic groups and if they said yes uh, and these were the groups that was there in the show card that the interviewer showed then they had a positive uh, probability of selection and obviously the groups that were most difficult to find had a higher selection probability and then after six months, we did a review and found that we were not going to reach the targets. And so two things were done. Selection probabilities for most groups were increased up to 100%. And additionally, um, additional addresses were selected from areas um, which had a higher density of Bangladeshi group, because this was a group that we were not going to reach even with increasing selection probabilities. And this is if you want to know more about the selection probabilities. Now, then in 2015, six years later, we realized, and as, it's, um, as Thomas had mentioned, that due to attrition, uh, the sample sizes for these ethnic groups had started uh, to decrease. Additionally, we initial, in the initial uh, boost sample, we had not targeted immigrants in general. We had targeted ethnic minority groups, particularly these five ethnic minority groups, which means immigrants from other countries, and now, these groups, as you would know, about 50% or more are immigrants from these ethnic minority groups. But it meant we did not oversample immigrants from any other country. So the idea for this uh, boost sample was that we would have 2,500 adult interviews from the five key target ethnic minority groups, the same as the first boost sample. But additionally, we would have 2,000 immigrants. And there could be some overlap between the two. And the design was very similar to the first one. That is, again, we selected addresses from high ethnic minority and immigrant concentration areas in Great Britain. And at the doorstep, the interviewer asked, is there anyone living at this address who was born outside the UK? If they said yes, the household was selected. If they said no, then they got asked the same screening question that we had asked the first blue sample. And then they were selected if they said yes. And again, if you want to know more about the sample designs, these are some, uh, these are the working papers that describe uh, these designs. And 
so I'll, in a little bit, I will show you the sample sizes that we get as a result of the boost samples. But just to um, give an idea that if you're planning on using the data, a few analysis tips to keep in mind is not to use the boost samples by themselves because that would result in coverage error. As you can see, we selected the boost samples from specific areas, the high ethnic minority concentration areas. Although that did cover 80% of ethnic minority population, you should always use it with the general population sample, which has a complete coverage. And weights are, of course, always provided to account for all this you know, unequal selection probability and non-response. And most of the samples are clustered and stratified. And so, again, we always say to take that into account when estimating standard errors. Now, I know this is a little bit of digression, but I just wanted to highlight these. Now, currently, 10 waves of data has been released. And every um, year, so for example, November of this year, the 11th wave data will be released and so on. So the question is, who is interviewed and what is asked? Um, before I go into it, I just a quick overview of the interview mode. Most of the interviews used to be done face to face up until the eighth wave with a few via telephone. And then from onwards wave eight, increasing percentage were done via the web. And of course, from last April, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, all interviews are now done via web and we've not returned to face-to-face -face interview. The uh, uh, one reason to talk about face-to-face -face interviews is we know uh, for ethnicity and migration research, it is um, difficult to uh, um, find and retain sample members and face-to-face -face interviews are very helpful in that because it establishes trust and people know them. So that's the reason I wanted to highlight this. So this is a longitudinal survey, which means there is a core sample, which is followed every year, as long as they are living within the UK. So every year we try to interview them. And in fact, from this year onwards, we've also started an immigrant survey. So those who leave the UK or are planning to leave the UK, we email them and ask them to participate in a short online survey, which identifies whether they've already left. And if they have, then they are asked an additional set of questions about their current situation. And the idea is that too will be longitudinal and we will keep following them every year. And if when they get back to UK, if they do, then they get back into the main survey and are asked um, the standard questionnaire. Now, although we follow the core sample every year, uh, we also interview any household members who have joined their household since the initial time that the sample was selected because they provide the household contextual information, but they are not followed if they leave uh, the household of these core sample members. Now, who is interviewed in these households? So the most of the information that is of relevance for you will come from uh, the adult interviews and because they are asked about almost every aspect of their lives. And I'll go into a bit detail in a little bit. But in addition to that, we collect some basic information about every person in the household, age, sex, marital status, employment status. We also administer a short household questionnaire to the person who owns or rents the household, uh, the accommodation. So ask them about whether they own or rent it, mortgage payments, other expenditures, consumer durables that they own, car ownership, and so on. We also um, administer a youth self-completion questionnaire to 10 to 15 year olds and ask them about their lives, their family, school, friends, health and well-being, use of technology, and so on. But we also do ask them the ethnic group and religion question. And then although we don't interview zero to nine year olds, we ask, uh, we collect information about them from their parents or guardians, like parenting styles, child development questionnaire, child maintenance, and so on. So now I will get to the um, main source of data, which is the adults who are defined as the anyone above the age of 16. So we of course ask them all basic sociodemographic information, including whether they're what their parents were doing when they were 14 year old, whether they were living with them, what type of occupation they were in and so on. We ask them very complete detailed education information, not just qualifications, 
but also training, vocational training, and so on. We ask current and past history of employment, family partnership, fertility histories, health and well-being measures, physical health, mental health, life satisfaction, all of that. And then a lot of questions on income, housing, uh, owner, house ownership, wealth, expenditure, deprivation, and then a whole bunch of attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior questions. Now, of course, I'm not going to go through all these questions, but you can find out about the questions, of course, from the questionnaires, but also we have a variable search tool online, which is you can easily search on keywords and see what questions we've asked on those um, topics. And this is where you can do that. This is the website and you can click on these and get to there. Now, as I said at the beginning that we ask a lot of questions on measuring ethnicity, I think identity migrant status. So I want to list out those. So we ask about own ethnic group as well as parents ethnic group, their current religion, and if they don't have one, then the religion they were brought up in, their own parents and all foreground parents countries of birth, the year they arrived to the UK. And we don't only sample as you have um, understood by now that we don't just sample recent migrants because these are people who may have been in this country for 50, 60 years. We ask about their citizenship status, national identity, a very detailed multi-dimensional ethnic identity question, uh, Britishness um, question, question about English language proficiency and childhood language question. That is a main language spoken at home during childhood. And a lot of these questions are asked repeatedly so that you can um, use that to measure integration, assimilation over the years. Now, as I had said, we also ask uh, an additional set of questions that are of a relevance for ethnicity and migration research called the extra five minutes questions. Now, we don't ask it of the whole uh, sample. We ask it of the relevant sample. So both the boost samples um, any ethnic minority individuals in the general population sample who are living in low ethnic minority concentration areas. This is to avoid selection bias because our boost samples are from high ethnic minority concentration areas. And then for comparison purposes, we have randomly selected 500 households from the general population sample. and They also get asked these questions. So what are these questions? So this is the detailed ethnic identity module, harassment, fear of harassment, discrimination, Migration history, migration intentions, reasons for migration, remittances, religious practice, influence, religiosity, how often they attend places of worship, ethnic composition at workplace, friendship net, ethnic composition of friendship networks and social networks. And um, as we all, as we all know that um, that now um, we know that the um, our, current, our life uh, outcomes and experiences are greatly influenced by where we live. And the UK, the Long Understanding Society sample is spread out across the UK. And we provide geographical locator variables at various levels of geography, which you can then use to link to um, external geographically linked data sets, like the census, deprivation index, uh, election data, police data, to enrich your research. And I'll give an example very soon. So just to give an idea about sample sizes, uh, as I've said, we've released 10 waves of data. And so these are the numbers of adult respondents from different ethnic minority groups over the 10 years. And as you can see, the numbers started falling due to attrition up until wave five. And then wave six, we added the additional boost sample and the numbers went up again. And the plan is to have these boost samples every few years, both to tackle attrition issues, but also to reflect the current population because migration patterns change. And if you're interested in children of migrants, so these are the ethnic uh, minority adult respondents who were born in the UK. And again, by um, different ethnic groups over the 10 years. So um, I'll just give a quick overview of the research that has already been done. So 
the best, so what we do is we uh, collect uh, information about research that has already been done using our data. And we have this database uh, where this is the web link. So you can go there and search using keywords. So I just searched using the word ethnicity and it brings up all the research publications that have uh, the word ethnicity in them using our data. And I want to quickly um, just let me know when I'm uh, running out of time. So um, I want to quickly give an overview of one research that I did using this data and hopefully that showcases what you can do with the data. So this was an ESRC funded project that we had a few years ago. It was about the prevalence and persistence of ethnic and racial harassment and its impact on health longitudinal analysis. So I did that with my colleagues here at Essex. So as I said that we had asked certain questions as part of the uh, five minute questions. And one of those was ethnic and racial, uh, sorry, it was a general harassment module. So people were asked questions about whether they were physically um, attacked or verbally attacked. And then they were asked uh, where they had experienced that and what was the reason. So we combined that information and produced this definition of ethnic and racial harassment. That is if someone was physically or verbally attacked or insulted in a public place in the last 12 months and the reason they gave was their ethnicity, religion or nationality. So these show the uh, estimates of people who have uh, ethnic minorities who have reported such experiences by ethnic group and gender. And overall, this makes up about 8.3% of the ethnic minority uh, sample uh, population. That is those who report this in the last one year. So you can see that um, there is difference by ethnic group, but also a very important distinction is that women are less likely to report experiencing ethnic and racial harassment. But then we realize that um, a larger proportion of ethnic minority women are not employed, which means they would not be in public places. Second is they could also avoid being in public places if they were afraid of experiencing this. So we had two other modules of questions which asked if you avoided a place or felt unsafe in a place. So what we did is we combined all the four types of uh, measures. And so it came up with this expanded definition. And as you can see, the numbers almost double. So about 8.3% of ethnic minorities have actually experienced this type of ethnic racial harassment in the last one year, but almost double would have avoided or felt unsafe in places. And the other thing to notice here for most ethnic groups now, women are more likely to report or as likely to report uh, these experiences as men. Uh, this is just putting that side by side. Um, then we also, of course, um, wanted to identify which types of individuals were more likely to experience ethnic and racial harassment. And so we used a whole lot of individual level um, variables like education, income, um, <clears throat> uh, marital status, and various other variables. But the one that I want to highlight here is that we um, is the neighborhood level information. So we linked our data to the census data, the electoral data and police data. So the census data, because you have information on ethnic group population for uh, the local area, which is the LSOA. And so what we found was that those who lived in an area with a lower proportion of their own, of people from their own ethnic group were more likely to experience uh, harassment. And similarly, those who lived in an area where there were a higher proportion of right-wing voters were also more likely to experience harassment. But we did not find any relationship with general levels of crime in the area. We also looked at the impact of ethnic and racial harassment on mental health. And we found that ethnic minorities do suffer poorer mental health if they have experienced ethnic and racial harassment. And actually when we compared it to the ethnic um, mental health difference between employed and unemployed, it was 1.3 times that difference. So it was uh, more, um, it was worse than that, those who had lost a job. 
but we also found that not only if you've experienced mental um, ethnic and racial harassment do you have poor mental health if you've not experienced it but just feel unsafe even they have poorer mental health and then we wanted to because we had uh, various other measures of ethnic identity and ethnic composition of friendship networks and so on we wanted to see if any of those reduce the mental health impact of such experiences and we found that higher um, sorry having stronger ethnic identity or more co-ethnic friendship ties did reduce this mental health impact but only for uk born ethnic minorities so um towards the last part of my talk so i just want to highlight some of the online resources that we have as you can imagine i in this time i cannot tell you about the survey and how you can use it but i want to point you towards the resources that we have so this is the web page for ethnicity and immigration data um, page that we have. So it highlights all the basic information that I covered today in greater detail. We have a user guide specifically for the, doing this type of research. So I would recommend reading that. We also have an ethnicity and immigration topic page, which covers research that has been used on this these topics using our data. We have webinars and blogs um, that discuss this um, also mentioned here. And then uh, to know more about the main survey uh, overall uh, with all its features, um, you can visit this web page and look at the user guide. Uh, this is more information about how to access the data. And finally, if you having gone through all these resources still cannot find the information you need, you can contact us uh, on our user support. We provide training. There are webinars, FAQs, and YouTube channel with training videos discussing all this. So happy to answer all that. And I just want to end with this. So we did run a COVID-19 survey last year, and it's um, also this year. So initially, it started in April. It was a monthly survey. And from after July, it became a bi-monthly survey. And the last wave was in March this year. Basically, all adults in households who had participated in at least one of the last two waves of data collection at that time, they were invited. And about 44% participated amongst those who were eligible. It basically is a short web questionnaire with questions about their lives, employment, schooling of children, and of course, COVID specific questions, mental health questions, and so on. And uh, this data is available as well. And because we already had an had these ethnic minority boost samples, the data has also been used to study uh, difference in the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on ethnic groups and migrant groups. So I want to end with that. And this is some information. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alita. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, Angela will now close the circle of, uh, of presentations with their commentary on, 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 on the two previous presentations. Please, Angela. Okay, thank you. I will share my, my screen. Okay, I prepared some slides. Can you see them? Okay, uh, so thank you, Marcello. Thank you, Elena, for um, organizing this um, nice uh, uh, policy dialogue webinar series uh, within the cost um, action uh, framework. Uh, I uh, thank also the, the speakers for their um, uh, interesting uh, presentation and for um, sharing with them. Um, with us uh, their uh, work on uh, um, immigrant integration using a longitudinal survey. Um, before commenting their, um, their presentations, I would like to um, to make some general um, considerations on, uh, on the topic. Uh, I think that it is important to highlight that integration is not something that will happen in the future, but it's a present uh, characteristic 
uh, of our uh, societies, which are uh, becoming more and more, uh, of course, at different uh, paces, uh, majority minority uh, societies. And uh, in general, uh, integration is not something uh, abstract, is something concrete. Is It can mean uh, maximize the opportunities of migration and to build a more uh, inclusive societies. And despite uh, the uh, ongoing efforts in this direction, there is still much to do in many European countries. For these and other uh, reasons, the uh, European Commission presented the new EU action plan on integration and inclusion for the next uh, seven years, which tries to which try to cover uh, the, the most important uh, institutions in which uh, immigrants uh, should gain uh, parity or uh, uh, with, uh, with, with natives. Uh, as far as the children of immigrants, uh, they are of course growing in many European countries, but uh, studying uh, immigrant integration among second generation uh, immigrants is not important only for uh, statistical or uh, statistical reasons. Uh, is important because the integration of the children of immigrants can be considered a test for uh, integration policies for the level of uh, um, inclusion of our um, societies, especially in the perspective of uh, uh, population aging, for instance, uh, who, uh, which our countries are facing today and will face in the next uh, in the next years uh, as uh, you highlighted in your uh, presentations mm, this process the integration process should be measured with the, the right instruments and uh, um, methods in general longitudinal analysis of panel data is important to understand causality among uh, issues, among uh, variables, and eventually to measure the effect of specific life course events. As um, uh, David Bartram has uh, argued uh, very recently, sometimes to fill the lack of longitudinal data, we as researchers, we tend to add a lot of information in our cross-sectional uh, models. Um, but uh, we ended up for hiding the true direction of the, the relationship. So in order to avoid, to, to, to miss some information, uh, information, important information, longitudinal data are extremely uh, necessary. Um, some key take home messages from your uh, presentations of today. Um, as far as Thomas' um, presentation, I would like to, to thank him in general for the, 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 the big, uh, the tremendous work that OECD is doing in helping us to understand immigrant integration. Um, for instance, the indicators of immigrant integration, which uh, cover a lot of topic uh, uh, on immigrant integration are extremely useful for, for us. Um, and also during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, OECD uh, demonstrated to be in the, in the front line to understand also the specific uh, effects of the pandemic crisis on immigrants and their uh, children. Um, today, Thomas said some important and uh, things that I would like to, to, to highlight. Uh, the importance of uh, having uh, longitudinal data for comparing a situation before and after migration or before and after the, uh, the point uh, in time we are living. It is absolutely important for understanding uh, immigration and integration processes. He also show us uh, the, the main pros and cons of census and uh, register and longitudinal uh, data and also some uh, kind of uh, attempts or strategies uh, to cope with the lack of longitudinal data which is something that we 
uh, experiment uh, in a, every every day in our in our life as as a researcher in particular the use of pseudo course with repeated cross sectional samples such as the lab of force survey the european union lab of force survey the also the attempt of following migrants by court and by duration of stays in order to understand the uh, change in their behaviors, in their attitudes, and so on, and also the uh, retrospective questions that try to understand something that happened in the past uh, to a migrants, or even if we are measuring it in today or at the time of the of the survey. And finally, um, as far as Alita's presentation is, uh, is concerned, I found extremely uh, useful and interesting the um, understanding society uh, structure. Uh, in particular, I found important the, the possibility to comparing different uh, ethnic groups uh, or to work uh, separately on different ethnic groups. So, because of the availability of large enough samples in your um, survey. And this is not obvious. Uh, this is uh, the problem that we sometimes face when we are working on a national survey on immigrant uh, integration. The, the, the possibility, the lack of exploring different ethnic groups among others, and uh, is I think it's also uh, interesting uh, the, the the specific design uh, according to which uh, the, the the survey is um, is constructed is um, is uh, conceived, and also the different selection criteria between the uh, two samples that you that you described with the, the last one, the, the second one, um, um, which uh, uh, increased the selection probability. Uh, and of course, the core sample followed every year, which is the, <laughs> the real possibility of gaining a causal explanation on, um, on factors, on, on, on variables. In, um, in the survey. Uh, personally, I also found uh, fascinating the possibility of comparing objective and subjective integration in your, in your survey. For instance, the possibility of measuring changes of subjective well-being among immigrants, which is something very, very uh, essential when studying this kind of topic, for instance, and also the possibility of following attitudes, intention, and behaviors among, uh, among uh, migrants. Finally, I also had the, the, the possibility of looking at the website and I found it extremely user-friendly, especially the, the variable research tool that I found uh, amazing. And I would like to, to, to conclude the, with, the, with the, a quick uh, question to, to Alita. So if I understood well the enabled variables, uh, uh, which depend on the ethnic diversity of uh, the, neighbor, uh, the neighborhood people uh, uh, are living, um, can increase or decrease the likelihood of experiencing ethnic and racial uh, harassment. Thank you uh, for this. Uh, it was a, a curiosity. And I leave the floor to, to Marcello for the, for the questions. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. Um, so there is already one question for Alita, I understand, but I would suggest uh, uh, maybe Alita hold on for a minute. Let's um, collect questions from the from the floor if there are any. Well, otherwise, we address this one and then and then start again. But uh, uh, please do feel free to ask questions. Hi, uh, Marcelo. I've got questions for both um, Alita and uh, Tomas. Do I do, do them all together? Ooh. Yes, please. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> Anita, I work in Ireland and I'm campaigning for an ethnic and immigrant minority boost uh, sample. So yours was, uh, your presentation was uh, very useful. Um, firstly, 
how did you convince the funders to conduct an ethnic minority boost in the first place? And secondly, in Ireland, we know from census data that there isn't so much um, residential segregation among uh, ethnic minority and immigrant samples. Does that just mean that the screening then will be more expensive? Which is even more to persuade the funders <laughs> to, to do it. <laughs> And uh, for, for Thomas, I'm interested in, um, firstly, what you mean by integrated admin data. This may mean something slightly different in Ireland. There's no population register. I, I know a lot of the administrative data sources from health, education, uh, social security, but I'm not sure if that's what you're uh, thinking of. Um, and uh, a second point on the on the longitudinal surveys of immigrants, I was involved in a in a cross uh, a cross national survey of new immigrants in four countries, of which Ireland was one, and it focused on sociocultural integration. One challenge we had there was that to conduct the second wave within the timing of the North Face funding, we needed to do the second wave eighteen months after the new immigrants arrived. And actually not so much had changed. We knew as a research team that this was too soon, but equally we knew we had to spend the money. I mean, we had other challenges too, like the recession in Ireland and the fact that immigration collapsed. Uh, so it was actually very difficult to find new immigrants and it took a long time. But, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of challenges, firstly, designing the questionnaires to be equivalent. Um, for, for even um, the four different countries, then finding a survey. We didn't actually find a survey organization in Ireland that was prepared to conduct it. Uh, so we, the research team had to do it themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, then it's just uh, just to point out that there, there are really rich questions there, but actually the sociocultural integration didn't change very much is my overall impression. Um, and finally, for anybody, do you know anything on um, the, the response rates of ethnic minorities and immigrants uh, to first interview comparing online and face to face? Uh, so not in a latest case like Understanding Society where it's a longitudinal survey and then it's moving online. But uh, do you know of any work that uh, that compares response rates. This is the notion related that trust is built in a face-to-face -face interview and then this may not be possible. That's just a general question. Okay. So sh should I go first? Or? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, maybe. Let's 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 make a first round. Okay. Mm. Um so well, friend, well, your first question was how we convince them. So this is a little bit before my time. When I joined, it had already been designed. But if you um, email me, I can um, tell you who is the person. So you may already know Professor Lucinda Platt at LSE. So she was the one who was designing this and she led the ethnicity strand. So she would be the person to contact to know about this. The second question was about uh, ethnic minority, concept, uh, I mean, ethnic minority groups in Ireland not being in certain areas, so they're spread out. Uh, then possibly again, yes, that it would be costly because you would have to screen people. And then my suggestion would be to contact Professor Peter Lin, who's uh, here at Essex, because he designed uh, both our ethnic minority boost samples, like he was involved in the design. So he may have suggestions. Uh, he's a survey methodologist and this is his area. And Angela's question about uh, neighborhood um, association. Yes, so what we did is we linked our data with, at the LSOA level, which is about 600 households around the individual's um, residential area. So that is already provided by the survey. So you know this indicator. And the census data is also provided at various levels, including the LSOA. And we had the population sizes of every ethnic minority, every ethnic group at each LSOA. So we linked that and we identified that the person's own ethnic group and the proportion of ethnic group, of that ethnic group in that area. And so what we found was if you lived in an area with higher proportion of your own ethnic group, you were less likely to experience 
at the generation of harassment. Thanks, Salita. Uh, Tomas, please go ahead if you wish. I think we lost him for a while. He might have connection issues. Um, let's give him some time to uh, connect back. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, I think I can see him now. Hello, Tomas. We lost you for a while. But uh, I think you heard um, you, you you were still there when when Frank was asking when Frank was asking her questions, right? So yes, please go ahead. Um, so so thanks very much uh, for the question, uh, Fran, and also to Angela, by the way, for the comment. Um, so so the first point was regarding this integrated admin data. Yes, indeed, it's it's linking different administrative data sets through common identifier, like social security number. Um, uh, which is um, uh, which is uh, which is increasingly increasingly common and increasingly done. Um, uh, for in Germany is doing a little bit a different approach. My is my understanding. For example, what they are planning to do starting next year is basically have just for the new arrivals like their their foreigners register number, and then basically to follow those people over time. And what a lot of countries are also doing now, obviously, is to feed in uh, um, survey uh, data into the administrative data which i which actually forgot to mention that that link was also mentioned by you uh, um, on the okay uh, um, I, I think that's also being increasingly done and, and then obviously the question arises how much value added does the longitudinal element always bring when you can do a uh, cross-sectional uh, studies at, uh, at at several times and link them with administrative data. But uh, the next point is a time horizon. And, and I think that's that's very important, uh, Fran, what you mentioned. Um, you know, politicians always want a relatively short uh, time horizon because they want to see results of their policies often. And, and that's also what the funding often reflects, uh, uh, basically, uh, to get relatively uh, quick results. But ideally, from, uh, from a researcher perspective, you would like to have a long Longer, uh, uh, um, a, a longer time horizon, uh, but clearly also the longer the time horizon goes, the more attrition becomes uh, becomes a problem. So that's obviously also also a trade off involved here. And last but not least, uh, the point of um, of new arrivals. Um, I, I think there's uh, most um, most uh, surveys. Um, um, like labor force survey, we know that they are underrepresenting uh, new arrivals for a number of reasons. Partly it's because of lack of language, partly because they're not yet registered or they're not yet in the sampling uh, covered in the sampling design, um, and, um, and 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 for a number of, uh, number of other reasons. Uh, so so all of that leads to an undercoverage of of new arrivals, which also needs to be taken into account. One if one were to use, for example. Um, um, uh, using a labor force survey, for example, in uh, pseudo cohorts or whatever, that you have that undersampling of, of new arrivals, which is a big issue in, uh, in many countries. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Um, is, is there any other question? I mean, I have other questions if, if other people don't, but I don't want to dominate. Uh, don't, don't worry, don't worry, feel free to ask. We still have a few minutes, so uh, there's still time. I mean, just want to raise with this group the, um, the advantages then of an ethnic minority boost sample to a survey like the Labour Force survey versus um, a, a, a migrant survey, uh, you know, I can see the attraction, Lita mentioned, I mean, it was only five minutes in understanding society, but presumably uh, all else equal, it would be cheaper as in mode and sample N and stuff, it would be cheaper to do the boost. There's no, there's not even a general longitudinal population, uh, longitudinal survey in Ireland. <laughs> so it would only be uh, getting getting reasonable samples in, in repeat, repeated cross sections. Uh, but um, I don't know whether um, people have views on that. It, it, it might actually be a more effective way of, of getting, uh, getting some of the information is having a boost with a little extra section. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I think so, because 
you see the um the boost sample members are still getting asked all the usual questions yeah. and these mm -hmm. are the questions so you can while these are specific areas but you know as uh, angela pointed out about economic integration etc you don't need these additional questions you can mm -hmm. figure out the employment status education and we can see how education for second gen is much mm -hmm. higher than the first gen and mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. these things can be identified and yes it is much better to do it this way and again the point is you you need longitudinal surveys for a very specific purpose it's it's not uh, you can do repeated cross section mm. or type of a survey which is rotating panels but yeah. this is the only way you can follow over a long period because mm. we know some of these measures as you've already seen doesn't they don't change quickly but they do change over time yeah and yeah. for example when we had in a different research looked at um, like, like angela mentioned subjective well-being life satisfaction uh, and we looked at how it differed from first gen and second gen, mm. but also mm. those who were recent arrivals to compared to those who had been here longer. There was very distinct differences across these. And so mm. you do want to measure those. Mm. If, if I can add, add on to that, I mean, um, I mean, if you're looking really, I make a proper longitudinal survey. I mean, just really think about the questions for which you really need a longitudinal yeah. survey. Mm. I mean, even if you look at, at the examples um, uh, that Alita was, was mentioning, a uh, uh, super interesting example. I think the survey is great, so it's no criticism at all. But I think none of these really required like a, a proper longitudinal data set. So it's actually quite hard to identify things. So you really absolutely need that longitudinal design, which you couldn't go by, by, mm. by callback question, uh, by keeping in mind the very important point mentioned by by Angela, uh, uh, that that often, obviously, when you lo look at something that's causality, and you have a uh, mm. and you have a recall question, then you're never going to get the real causality or whatever. But but is it really mm. uh, um, um, particularly uh, unless you want to do some kind of program uh, uh, like impact analysis mm. or whatever? Uh, uh, then you probably need that. Other than the, uh, but but in that case, perhaps other means. Could would also do that, mm. and, and and you're rather more concerned about having an adequate comparison group. Um, I, th mm. I find it uh, the more and more I think about it, and, and that we thought I thought about it a, a lot in, in, in recent in recent months because of a hate and interest in these longitudinal surveys. Um, and what's really the the value added that would justify a longitudinal survey compared to a, a cross sectional survey? Boost the sample with some additional questions that would give you the information that you're actually looking for. So, sorry, just to add for a lot of things, you're right. <laughs> you can do without it. But particularly for integration issues, for example, mm. you can see that over time, people, you know, their as a, as a, association with, uh, for example, we had questions on national identity, Britishness. So you can see how it changes over time. You can also see how their mm. economic outcomes change over time. But in order to know which leads the other, is mm. it those who are economically integrated feel more social integrated or the other way around, mm. you, you need to follow the same people. So I agree that not everything you need the longitudinal survey for, but for some things like these, where you have these multiple processes going on, it does help you with the time order of things. And so. Yes, I also think this is from other research, not specifically on immigrants and ethnic minorities, Thomas said, um, while it's easier to ask people whether they were working one year ago or five years ago or whatever, it's more difficult to ask them about their well-being or um, other uh, more uh, of these sort of socio-cultural uh, indicators because it, they, they frame their past experience on the basis of their current experience. So if they're, you know, if it's nine out of 10 on life satisfaction, they'll tend to retrospectively kind of count that. So in terms of this sort of social, sociocultural integration, sort of softer um, indicators, I think the, the but, um, but we haven't got either in Ireland anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment <laughs> but i do agree that if these this were so because longitudinal surveys can be both prospective and retrospective so if you have retrospective longitudinal surveys there is a problem because you know as fran is saying that if you're asking people about their past histories they forget yeah. they mm. adjust and do all sorts of things but ours is mostly prospective mm. Mm. so if we must have it we should do it prospectively ask them about the current situation yeah and build it up again it takes time and it's costly but 
it has value from that perspective for those research questions. Yes, sorry, Alita, I didn't. I, I was thinking of asking them retrospectively in a in a longitudinal survey, you know, or sorry, in a cross sectional survey true, true. as a little bit. Do you know the way? But uh, but yeah. No, that reminded me of this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you do it. Thank you. Yes. And clearly, then, when you have a panel study, a proper panel, you can make much, much more solid, much more robust causal statements, no? because you can control uh, much better for possible confounders. Um, but OK, it's almost time. We still have a couple of minutes for additional questions, if there are any. But um, otherwise, uh, um, we can call it an end. But I would like to thanks again to thank again the uh, the participants and the organizations for for their contribution, the speakers in the first place, and uh, and also Fen and for animating the debate and, and all the others for being here and then and I as always for, for organizing this. Um, so we have uh, just a little announcement. We have the last webinar in two weeks with the, with the ASO, the European Asylum Support Office, which is the uh, EU asylum agency, uh, and they will be presenting their projects on serving uh, refugee populations. Uh, they will be their special guests, but then we also have uh, some presentations from the uh, ethnic survey data side. Uh, Elena, uh, would you remind us who that will be? Yeah, we have uh, a presentation uh, from a uh, uh, colleague that is uh, Lazari Branco. This is uh, doing a survey on Sir uh, Syrian refugees across Europe. And uh, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So that's for the 20 seconds. So thank you very much again. Have a nice afternoon and, and see you next time, maybe. Thanks, Bye. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank the you. presentations Bye. were great. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Really helpful. Thanks. Bye.